good morning, everybody. Wow, you guys are wide awake. That's what I love about the 11 o'clock service. You guys are well caffeinated by the time we get here. Um, I cannot believe that we're leaving on Tuesday. It's always seemed like so far away, and it's, it's right next door now that uh, we get ready to leave. I would love for you guys to remember us in prayer throughout this week. Even these next couple days, if you talk to any of the team members today, and I'd encourage you to do so, we're all a little bit anxious. Some people are anxious about what they're going to pack. Um, some people are anxious, and I don't know why, about spending more than 18 and a half hours on a pressurized can in the air, um, getting across customs. It will all be a grand adventure, but we, uh, we would covet your prayers. We would cover your, covet your thoughts this next week as we see what God will do through us and in us as part of this trip to India. And uh, if you haven't already, if you would like our Facebook page, the Community Church of Batesville or Greensburg, we will try to post updates and pictures. I've kind of made it my own personal um, desire to take pictures of people as they're sleeping at the airport and on the plane with them. Um, so we'll try to give you some things to laugh about as well. But uh, anyways, um, if you're like me, um, I'm guessing this morning that there's very few physical things that you might like about yourself. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but isn't it true that when we look in the mirror, uh, we tend to focus on the things we're not so happy about rather than the things that we actually might like. Um, so now when I look in the mirror, I'll be completely honest with you, it's a little bit harder than for you guys because first the glare off my forehead, it takes a while for my eyes to adjust, but once I, my eyes adjust, I'm always drawn to my belly. It seems like every year I get older, I'm one more pound past my target weight. Um, I look at those little gray hairs that are popping up on the sides out of the, you know, I got a little real estate left and now it's turning gray. Or maybe it's wrinkles that weren't there last week or sure didn't seem to be. But when we step in front of the mirror, that's what we focus on. We focus on the things we don't like. But my guess is that every single one of us has maybe a few things about ourselves physically that we actually like. So mine is that I'm tall. I like being tall. Um, I've always appreciated being tall. It has treated me well. I mean, even if I go to a concert and I'm in the back, I can see above all of you. I always have a great view. Um, when I was a kid, I was always picked sort of first on the teams, even though I had no coordination. Um, I was the tall guy, so I must be good for something. Um, and then, if many of you know my wife, Melissa. I don't know how she would know what is on the top shelves in the grocery store if I wasn't with her. Uh, I've seen her try to reach them before. It's a danger to her. It's a danger to others. So uh, if you are above average height, you might have appreciated some of those advantages in life as well. But you may have also heard three words that I've heard my entire life. Stand up straight. Stand up straight. It has variances, which are stand up straight, John. You're going to look like that forever, John. Stand up straight. It, I don't know what it is when you're tall. It, it's like the chairs don't fit you, so you slump a little bit. And I don't know if it's gravity or laziness or the combination of the two, but I have never, ever been able to stand up straight, or not without a whole lot of effort. But as I've grown older, as I've, as I've continued to age, I find out that posture and position for your body is actually kind of a big deal, right? Like when, when I was played sports, when you went to hit the baseball, there was a certain position you needed to be in to get the most leverage to hit it. Or in basketball, I had a certain position I needed to be to rebound the ball. And then as I got older, when I was in the business world, we had a, a leadership development coach come in who actually told us the way that we position and the posture that we have when we speak affects the impact of our communication, how we lead. Um, as we get older, if you, if you work out, and I know we have a lot of people that like to exercise and work out, you're taught that there's certain positions you need to be in when you lift or when you run so you can get the most impact and don't hurt yourself. Uh, even if you have a desk job, right, they say you need to sit a certain way on your chair and we have special keyboards and wrist rests to hold our, our arms and our hands in the right posture. Posture and position of our bodies is important and we learn that as we get older. But did you know that there's also a posture and position of our hearts. Did you know that your heart also has a position? I, I know that may sound a, a little odd, but sometimes we refer to it as maybe our attitudes or our motives. What really goes on the inside, what's really going through our heads, that indicates the position of our hearts. And sometimes it's connected to our physical and other times it's not. But like ex if I was standing up here like this and we were talking I, I don't seem very friendly or very open to your ideas. Um, how many people have ever had a teenager in their house? Anybody have teenagers in their house? How many times have you asked them to do a chore or homework and you get this? Okay. <laughs> All right, their, their posture, their posture kind of give, gives across that they're a little indifferent. They might not be really listening and connected to what you're asking them to do. 
And so it's funny how the posture and position of our hearts actually affects the posture and position of our bodies. I mean, the, the easiest example I can give you is kids at Christmas time, right? We've all seen that one kid who opens each present carefully and, and looks at it, maybe even plays with it and thanks you and then goes to the next present. And then you got another kid who's ripping them open and asking you which one's next as they throw that toy aside. But it's true, the posture and position of our hearts, of our attitudes, of our motives, it affects our physical being. It affects how we perform. So this, this last three weeks, we've been in a series that we've called Living Upside Down in a Me First World, the remix version. And before the remix version, Seth took us through the teachings and instructions of Jesus as he called us to live differently in this Me First World. He called us to live counterculture to how society told them to live back then and how they tell us to live today. I mean, Jesus used terms like deny yourself or the first shall be last and the last shall be first which just emphasized what he was calling us to. He told us that when we prioritize the kingdom of God, which is the ways of God, how God views the world, when we prioritize that instead of me first, he's got something so much greater for us in our lives. When we prioritize the kingdom of God, he has so much more for us in life. And so these last few weeks, as we've continued to look at that teaching, We've also had some concrete opportunities during our time together to get plugged in, to actually put that teaching into action. We've had opportunities to roll up our sleeves, get up out of our seats, get up out of our rows, and live this amazing life that he's called us to. And so today, just like last week, we have invited a very special guest to join us, Tanya Richter-Rubel from SEI, which is Southwest Southwest Eastern Indiana, Southwest Eastern, uh, Southeastern Indiana Voices for Children. Hey, I'm directionally challenged, leave me alone. Um, Southeastern Indiana Voices for Children. Uh, She's going to be sharing with us today, and you're going to hear about the amazing passion and burden that God has put on her heart and on the heart of her organization to help those in need. And you're going to have an opportunity, if God is putting that same burden on your heart, to join in with her and serve alongside her with Voices for Children. But before we have her come up, before we give you a potential another opportunity to roll up your sleeves and get involved, I want to spend a few minutes talking about our posture and position of our hearts. Specifically, the posture and position of our hearts when we serve. Because serving was so central to what Jesus taught. It was so central to how he lived, helping others. But in addition to helping others, in addition to serving, God wants the position of your heart to be in the right place. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to be in the book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, you could turn there with us. The book of Luke, chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We will have it up on the screen behind me so you can follow along. Luke is the third book in the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke. And together with the book of John, we call those the Gospels. It's a story of Jesus' life and ministry while he was here on earth. And we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 17, we're going to pick it up a few verses in. Actually, a few weeks ago, Seth, uh, Seth gave us a message about forgiveness when the apostles were asking Jesus, hey, how many times do we need to forgive someone? And Jesus used, a term, or used the phrase 70 times 7 or 77, depending on what your translation says, which is, His way of saying, you never stop forgiving. It's like infinity and beyond. You need to keep forgiving others. And so the conversation we're going to look at this morning happens right after that, right after that. So we pick it up in verse 5, Luke 17, verse 5. And it says, the apostles, that's the 12 that uh, Jesus chose as his small group. We've been talking about them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's kind of an odd request. It's a very large request. Um, The New Testament was written in Greek, and and the word, the Greek word used for faith here means your trust and reliance in God. So in other other words, the apostles were saying, hey Jesus, how can we trust and rely on God more? How, How do we do that in our lives? Now, I'm expecting, just as we would, that the disciples thought maybe they'd get a checkoff list, right? You know, here's the 10 things, you can check them off your list, that way you get closer to God. Maybe they thought they'd get a sermon with three bullet points that all start with the same letter. Those are easy to follow. But I'm pretty sure they didn't expect what Jesus said next. And so Jesus replies in verse six, he says, if you had faith 
like a grain of mustard seed. Now, mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds. If you've ever seen it, it's really, really small. If you had faith like a, a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, you may have heard this verse before, or you may be more familiar with the Matthew uh, teaching where Jesus said, with faith you can move mountains. There's lots of pictures in people's homes or in your office that say, with faith you can move mountains. And so we kind of get where Jesus was going here. He was saying that, hey, if you had just a little bit of faith, if you trust God just a little bit, you can accomplish anything because God's the creator of the universe. He holds everything in his hands. He can do anything, and you can trust in that. But I'm not sure if the disciples knew that. We've got the benefit of hearing it and looking at it or maybe heard it preached on before. I imagine there's silence right now. I mean, I don't know about you, but I probably would have been caught up in Did he just say move the mulberry tree? I want to increase my faith, and Jesus just said we could move that mulberry tree, and why would we plant it in the middle of the sea anyways? What what would it do there? They, They kind of missed it, as we sometimes miss when God's saying something to us. So Jesus then, he changes the word picture entirely. He he decides, you know, I'm going to use something that maybe you guys are more familiar with. So he goes on in verse 7 and says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep Say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at my table. Now, Jesus wasn't condoning slavery here. It's, it's that slavery was an acceptable part of the culture back then, so the disciples would understand this word picture. They, they understood that when you were a servant, or if you had a servant, and they were out in the field all day long, or tending the sheep all day long, that even after a hard day's work, they didn't walk in the door and their master or their manager or their boss, whatever you want to call them, He didn't say, hey, I know you're tired. Why don't you come in, sit next to me, sit next to me and we'll eat. That's not how it worked. I mean, this to them was a rhetorical question. They completely understood. There's no way this would happen. Servants serve. And so he said, would he rather not say to them, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. And again, the disciples would have nodded at this. This makes sense. It didn't matter how long you worked in the field. It didn't matter what you were doing. When you came back in for the day, you were expected to go get cleaned up, to prepare supper for your master, serve them so they could eat, and then you would get yours. This wasn't mistreatment. This was how society worked back then. And again, he, he asks another rhetorical question in verse 9. Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? No, I mean, the disciples would have gone, no, you you don't get thanks, servants serve. That's what servants do. And so in verse 10 then, Jesus says, so you also, and we're we're gonna stop for a second. We tend to sometimes gloss over uh, words like this that start out a verse, but this is a summary statement. Uh, This is something we need to pay attention to when we see written. Because what Jesus is saying is, all right, look, you, you get it now. You didn't get the mulberry tree example, but you get the servant thing. You understand that when servants go out and are serving all day long after a hot day, back-breaking work, and they come in, their job is to continue to serve. And then they'll eat and drink. You kind of get that now. So let's go back to your question, apostles. Your question was, how do we increase our faith? How do I grow my, my trust and my reliance in God? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded. Say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. I'm going to read that one more time. When you have done all you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So you want to know how to increase your faith, guys? You want to know how to grow in trust and reliance in God? i got a two-part answer for you here. One is, when you have done all you were commanded, when you put into action what I'm teaching you, when you actually do what I'm instructing you to do. We talked about it last week, I'll repeat it again. Jesus didn't teach just so that we would know something. He didn't teach so we would know. In fact, I'll date myself a little bit here. I used to watch this cartoon, G.I. Joe, when I was a kid, and at the end of G.I. Joe, they always had like this little life lesson, and they'd have this phrase that sticks with me, knowing is half the battle. Knowing is half the battle. And that's right, knowing is only half the battle. Doing is the other half. And so Jesus is saying here, look, I I don't want you just to know. I don't want you just to study. 
I don't want you just to nod and agree. Those are all good. I want you to do. I need you to roll up your sleeves and do what I'm commanding you to do. When you have done all that, you've, all that I've commanded you to do. But then second, he addresses our hearts. He addresses how we should do. And at the end of the verse, he says, when you're done doing, what you should say is, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. Which is basically Jesus saying, we are unworthy servants is humbleness. When you serve, you serve in humbleness. And you're only doing what you were told to do. You're serving out of obedience. The position of our hearts when we serve others, the positions of our hearts when we take Jesus' teaching and put it into action needs to be in humbleness and obedience. I mean, all throughout this series, we've talked about what Jesus is calling us to, how he's calling us to live differently, live upside down in this me first world. We've had concrete ways, either through community groups or last week with Bread of Life, to, to serve, to find ways to be his arms, his hands, his feet. But if you haven't figured it out right by now, Jesus wants more than just your hands and feet. He wants more than just for you to physically do. He wants your heart. And what he wants you to do is when you serve, serve in humbleness and obedience. The position of your heart as you serve will affect the way that you serve. Now, you may be here today and you may say, well, I, I'm not real sure I agree who Jesus is yet. I, I, haven't come, I haven't come to grips with, is he who he really claimed to be? So what do I do with this? The same thing. Because at some point, if you're wondering if you can have more faith in God, if you're asking Jesus the same question, how can I increase my faith in God? Then you need to take that step. You need to serve. And I promise you, when you serve, and when you serve in humbleness, when you serve in obedience, God meets you there. You will see just how real he is. Just how real he is. So in answer to the apostle's question, when does our faith grow? Your faith grows when you serve in humbleness and obedience. Our faith grows when we serve in humbleness and obedience. As I mentioned earlier, this week we have a, a very special guest with us, a friend of mine, Tanya Rubel Richter, will be joining us here in just a second. Um, she's from Southeast Indiana Voices for Children, or you might know it as CASA. Um, she's going to share a little bit about her journey, um, her organization, and what they do. Um, CASA is one of our ministry partners. Uh, a ministry partner is an organization or an individual that, as a church, we support financially. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but 10% of all the money that we receive, we give back out to our ministry partners because we believe that they're making an impact in our communities and beyond for Jesus. We believe that they're serving others in need. And so our hope for you during these few weeks where we have our ministry partners join us is really quite simple, three things. One, so you can know more about what they do. We, we support them financially and we want you to know where part of your money is going. We think what they're doing is extremely important. And so it's great for you to know what they do. Second, we'd love for you to start praying for our ministry partners. We love writing a check. Prayer is more powerful than money. So we would love for you to be praying for our ministry partners and what they do. But then last but not least, and we're going to come back to this at the very end, we want you to personally get involved with one or more of our ministry partners. Because, while, again, while we love financially supporting, while we love being part of what they do, we believe that God's called each of us to serve personally. I mean, one of the reasons why we think personal service is such a huge part of your faith journey is because that's, that's exactly what Jesus taught. And so by knowing more, we're hoping that God will nudge your heart. He'll poke your heart a little bit and say, hey, I want you to get involved there. So at that, would you please join me in welcoming Tanya up to join us. I was at um, the other church, and Tim Sweeney said to let you know that I wasn't in a hurry because I could talk as long as I want here, since <laughs> there's nowhere to go after this. So he said, you're fine, you're fine. So um, thanks, first of all, for having me, John. I appreciate it so much. Um, we at Voices for Children are so thankful for your church, your congregations that have stepped in and supported us. You guys were the first church to do that. Now, thankfully, not the only one, but the very first one um, that laid the groundwork for that, and we are so thankful. Um, I do personally feel that the work that we do is closely aligned um, with, with God's mission, and I'm so thankful to be a part of it. Um, this definitely isn't about me, but I think, as John mentioned, my story and how I ended up here is just another example 
of how God has worked time after time to put people in place to help the kids that we work with. So to start with, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And what we do is we advocate for children who have been abused or neglected by their own caregivers. So they're in the system involved with the Department of Child Services in the court system because they've been abused. So that's when we come in and we help them. Um, with that being said, I, had, I was born and raised in one county, Butler County in Ohio, had lived there my entire life, had no idea that other worlds existed, and then my husband said, let's move to Indiana. So we ended up um, in Jefferson County, very rural area, Canaan, if y'all have ever heard of it. Um, I had no idea places like that still existed. Madison is much like Batesville, in my opinion, like a Mayberry. Um, and I just thought it was this amazing, beautiful place. And then I met the previous director of Voices for Children. After church one day, we were at lunch, just chit-chat, what do you do for a living, you know, what, do you, what are you interested in? And she told me about CASA. And I was floored that I had lived that long, nine years ago this was, and had not known anything about CASA. So I said, oh my gosh, I have to do that. So I signed up to become a volunteer. I did that for about three or four years. And then I just felt like God was hitting me over the head with this. Like, you know what you're supposed to do. You know where you're supposed to be. And I had not worked with children in several years. Um, I had gone to school for that, thought that was my dream when I was younger, and then had gotten away from it and had worked in the business and sales field for like 20 years. And I just literally felt like he was hitting me over the head. And so against my husband's <laughs> better judgment, I ended up um, leaving the world of recruiting, going into social work. Um, after I became a CASA, I was so heavily moved by seeing in the trenches what these kids go through that I knew that I wanted to spend my life helping them in, in, in another way. So I became a social worker, did that for years, was on the board of directors for Voices for Children, and then the same day, right after I finished my master's, again, thinking I'm gonna control all this, and. I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, you know, I, I'm such a control freak that I thought, I've got this nailed, I know what I'm doing. And then the job that I had already been promised fell through and the exact same day, I was offered this position of director at Voices for Children. So I was like, geez, oh, Pete's, all right. So every time I think I'm controlling and I'm going a certain way, he derailed me and put me in another lane. And what I have found now, I've been the director for about four and a half years, that was in 2014, and what I have found is time after time after time, he is using us to help these kids, and it is the coolest thing. Um, someone said to me right before I left the, uh, your other location um, a few minutes ago, he said, I can tell that this is your lane. This is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what God's using you for. And I was like, that's such a compliment, and I'm so thankful. But I also told him, I wish it weren't. You know, I wish that he had given me a different lane because, and never have I ever done a speaking thing where I don't cry, just so you know. <laughs> so that's definitely not on purpose, but... Um, it's, it is heavy, it's ugly, it's all those things that you think it's gonna be. But on the other side of that, I am so thankful to be in a position where we are literally building an army that is fighting for these kids who have gone through things that, that, is, that are unspeakable, that they should, never should have to go through. And we're the ones that, that light up their faces when we walk in. We're the ones that they know are there just for them. And it's so cool. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that, but I wanna show you, we have a connection with two people um, from the, who have been CASAs from your congregation, and the first one was Michelle Garrett. Is she here? I, I was going to say I didn't see her, but that's what happens when you're late. Um, but so she, Michelle came to us having been a kiddo who was in the system herself, and she had a CASA, and so she grew up and wanted to be a CASA to help give back in ways that, that had helped her. So with that, she was on the missions team, and then she invited me to come and speak to the group, and that's where we met John and, and Bill Goodwin. And so we have two brief videos for you that your church put together for us, and um, so I'd like to show those. If we can show Bill's first, please. I'm Bill Goodwin. My wife, Christine, and I attend the Batesville campus, and I've been a CASA since December of last year. I became a CASA because I'm a member of the missions and outreach team. Michelle Garrett, who's also a member of that team, talked to us about her experience having a CASA and being a CASA. And she introduced us to Tanya Rubel Richter and Voices for Children. And when Tanya came and spoke to us, it compelled me to become a CASA. There's a song by Hillsong United called Hosanna, and one of the lines is, break my heart for what breaks yours. And that's why I became a CASA. Well, I was afraid to become a CASA. I was afraid of what I would see, what I would experience, what trauma and tragedy there would be, and was I emotionally strong enough to deal with that, what I experienced? 
However, I know that I have the power of the Holy Spirit within me that has equipped me to serve in whatever way I'm called. And CASA has a saying, if not you, then who? The first thing that equipped me to be a CASA is my 59 years of life experience. Everything I've done, being a father and a husband and a grandfather and a banker and a neighbor, a churchgoer, all of my life's experiences have equipped me to be a CASA. Second is my faith. God has made lots of promises to orphans and vulnerable children to rescue and deliver them, to defend their cause, to hear them, to not forget them, to be their helper, to secure justice for them, to uphold their cause, to extend mercy towards them. We know that God's promises are true, and while God does not need me in order to keep his promises to the orphans, he can use me as he keeps his promises. It's easy to advocate for the child. I spend my time gathering information by talking to people, reading documents, going and observing what's going on. Then I get guidance from the Voices for Children staff. I make recommendations either to the Department of Children's Services or to the judge in a written report. And essentially, I speak the truth without blame or judgment. I feel like my involvement is making a difference. I feel like I, by advocating for the child, I'm affecting the outcome. I'm a CASA, and I am for the child. My name is Michelle Garrett. I had a CASA when I was a child and it greatly affected my life. When I was nine years old, I was taken away from my dad and I was sent to live with my aunt and uncle and um, it was even, I, I would say worse than my dad. My dad was an alcoholic but you know he did provide and protect us and, um, and then we were sent to live with my aunt and uncle, because he was in trouble with the law and was going to do some jail time, but there was actually abuse and, and severe neglect and things like that. And um, so we were taken away when I was 12. I was put in an orphanage. I was trying to be adopted with my brother and my sister. We were almost fostered, but it was too much for foster families. And we were almost, I was almost adopted with my brother, and it was still too much, and that fell through. And finally, it was to the point of they gave me an ultimatum of you will not be adopted with your siblings so you will either be adopted by yourself or wait until you age out so um but the casa came in at the point where they were like you'll be adopted or age out you need to let me know and she she explained all this to me and she also knew the families that were trying to adopt me at the time there were three there were two families from my church and one of my friends um aunt and uncle who were in the running to adopt me and but the casa nobody asked me the first time nobody asked me for almost two years in the children's home what my thoughts were and then finally when i was facing adoption finally a casa said is anybody going to ask her <laughs> the casa is the one who went to court on my behalf. We met a few times. She decided that I was level-headed and that I should have um, some say in who, in who I got adopted by. And so she was actually the reason why I got to sit in on a meeting with the, the different families that were trying to adopt me. So I, I was the first, from what the judge had told me, the first kid to get to sit in and, and have some say in who would adopt me. So if, if you guys heard Michelle there, over two, two years was the second time that she said. So I don't know how long, I can't remember on her story how long she was in the system before that, but at least two years, maybe three years, four years, no one asked her what she wanted. I mean, can you imagine that? And she was an older youth at that point. She was in her teens by that time. So no one asked her. No one considered what her voice was. No one wanted to know of these three families that want you, which thank God she had that because a lot of our kids don't have that, and that, that's a definite plus. But of those, what do you think? Where would you like to live? Who would you like to go home to every single day after school? Who would you like to call mom and dad? No one had asked her for one second what she thought of that. So she had been through all the trauma. First of all, she was detached from her own family because of the things that she had gone through. And then the answer to that, when they took her out of that home and put her in another one, she was further traumatized and went through more abuse and neglect, and no one still asked her what she thought at that point. 
So in looking at her life and her opinion and what was in her best interest, the only thing steering that case were the parents and the system. And that seems crazy, I know. It was to me too when I first got involved in this, but that's the way it goes. And that's why CASA exists. So CASA, since 1977, CASA has been um, in our country, it's been growing significantly. It is a national program and it's in 49 states. And Indiana is the second largest in the country, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, that with the amount of resources and population, a lot of our areas being rural, that we are actually one of the leading states in the country for CASA. And that's because our legislators and our Supreme Court and everything that runs the state of Indiana on, on that judicial level and legislative level understands the importance of these children having a voice. And with that, we have been able to grow hand over hand over hand year after year. And Voices for Children, for instance, we had in the beginning of 2015, we only had four volunteers in Ripley County, and today we have 30. Overall, we were serving about, between two, our two counties, we do Jefferson and Ripley County, we, had, we were serving approximately 60 kids, today we're serving 132. But as much as we've grown and grown and grown, we still have, so have the number of, of abused children in our communities. And that's largely due to the drug epidemic, which everyone is completely aware of. But we have families who are coming from broken places and who have lived through broken times of their own. And a lot of them are just repeating what they've been through. So it isn't about casting blame. And I love when Bill says it's not about judgment. None of this is about judgment. It's about coming in here and looking at what's going on with these families and seeing how, how can we fight for this kid? How can we give this kid an even playing field? So when we have an attorney for the parents, which is the law, right? Everything in the system is geared toward the parents' rights. So we have them in a court. We literally have a courtroom where we come and, and everyone's deciding what's going to happen for these kids like Michelle. And we have a parent sitting there who, who was the perpetrator with, with an attorney. And then we have the system, the Department of Child Services, and they're sitting there with an attorney. The kid is usually not even at the hearings, and there's no, there's no attorney for the child. There's no one speaking for the child. So there's a huge gap. And if I were to draw a picture up here, you would look at that, and common sense would tell you there's a gap there. So that's what CASA is. A judge in the 70s came forward and said, look, I, I don't know what to do. I've got the system saying one thing, the parents saying another thing, and he pulled a layman, a community person, volunteer, and said, I want you to go and look at this and report back to me without any bias what you think is in this child's best interest. And that's what happened, and now here we are. So in our two counties alone, we have over 16,000 volunteer hours a year. So we are serving kids, and every volunteer spends approximately 10 hours a month per case. So it isn't this huge thing that, that seems insurmountable. But what is ugly is that despite all of our growth, we still have 165 kids on our wait list. So we aren't able to serve every child. So that's why we do things like this, and we're so thankful for the partnership here that we get, that we get an open mic here to come and explain this to you and explain how these kids are in need. So what we do is we investigate the case, as Bill said, and I love when Bill said, well, it's easy to advocate for the child because everyone thinks this isn't easy. And it's heartbreaking, it's gut-wrenching, it's all those things, but the thing that's easy is to step into these and see the things that doesn't look right. And that's what we do. So we have this saying, like you go, like we tell our CASAs, because every CASA that we have has a different background, a different comfort level, a different experience, a different history, and they come in with all different skill sets and they just, we tell them, just look at it and see what you think. You talk to the child, you meet with the child face to face. We know these kids better than DCS. DCS will tell you that. We're the expert on the child. We get to know them. We're the ones that they tell if they do well on a test. We're the ones that they say, man, my foster sister is driving me nuts. And we are the one that doesn't change throughout the case. So their family case manager in, from DCS in their case can change. I mean, I have a case right now where the DCS person has changed six times. The turnover is insane. Their therapists are changing. I mean, their teachers are changing because they're moving from home to home. So their friends or any social connections they have at all is changing. Everything is changing for these kids, and that's after already being detached from what their normal was. So they need someone who's going to stay the same and someone who's going to come in and not, not be pressured on a timeline, not be pressured by policies and all these things that we are supposed to say, which is every single person involved in these cases has something that they have to do. We don't. The only thing we have to do is show up and let them know that they are worthy, that they are valued, and that they are important, and that we are there just because of them. And they have no idea, most of them are younger than Michelle, and most of them have no idea what all this means. 
we have, I won't say details since there are kids in the room, but that we had a, a little girl who had gone through the worst things you can imagine. And she had no idea what her dad was doing was wrong. And so when her dad was gone, and he's in prison for 35 years here in Batesville, she didn't know. And she, she told us, she told the CASA, she said, well, I don't, I don't know what my dad did, but it must have been really bad because he's going to be gone for a long time. She had no idea. So we have these kids coming from these things, and then we get to step in. It's not that we have to. We get to. We get to be the one that steps in and looks at that kid and tells her how important she is and how her life can be so different than everything that she has come from. And sometimes we're the first person to ever say that. Sometimes we're the only one that asks them, hey, how'd you do on your test? Or how are things going with Bobby, you know, that was pulling your hair last week at school? I mean, sometimes we're the only one that really gets in the nooks and crannies of that and actually cares about how they feel and what's going on in their lives. And the longer I do this, the more it affects me, which seems kind of crazy, but I was at, I have three sons myself, and I had, the other day I was at my youngest son, he's on, he just turned nine, and I was at his football game, and it was freezing cold, it was raining, and I looked over, and there were these little cheerleaders, and it was the first day we had cheerleaders. I don't know where they came from mid-season, but it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. And some of them were tiny, you know, like four or five years old. And they all had, like, jackets and their ponytails in with matching socks and all this and little umbrellas and boots. And the next crew was coming in next, and they were sitting on blankets with blankets over their laps and eating snacks. And it just melted my heart at the simplicity of that and the things that we all take for granted because my boys had all that too when they were little and my son was there and you know playing football all my boys had that stuff but the contrast of how some kids live versus others it just slapped me in the face in that moment and that's what I want you guys to know is that you know I know everyone's against child abuse this is the easiest when I took this job I'm like man I, I did sales and recruiting for years that was this is the easiest thing I'm ever gonna have to sell right everyone's against child abuse but it isn't easy because everyone is intimidated by it people say someone just said to me at the last church that um, I think that I would get mad I don't know how I would do that because I would get mad well I'm mad too you know everyone's mad and you should be mad but it's like what do we do with it from there because every one of these kids, we cannot undo what they've been through. And I, my God, I wish I could. We can't take away their trauma. We can't take away their hurt and what their normal was. But what we can do is step in beside them and show them that not everyone is like that. Because sometimes we're the first one to show them that. Because all these other people that are coming in are strangers to them. And we might be the first one that actually sits down with them and lets them know that we care about them and that we're not a stranger. And they can talk to us. And at first, they're not going to. They're going to think you're, you're one of the rest of them. But eventually, they're going to understand and see in you that why you're there is different. And it's completely different. So with about 10 hours a month, we look at the cases. We have authority under the law, which is the coolest thing. And again, in Indiana, we have more than most states where we're a division of the Supreme Court here. So even though our program, Voices for Children, is an independent 501c3 charity, we have authority under the law that we take our appointment orders in these cases and we can get anything we want on them. We have more authority and clearance with confidentiality under the law than DCS does. So we can get their mental health records, their medical health records, their teachers' um, reports. There's no one in their case that we can't talk to and get information from. And it's so cool, and it seems crazy that a volunteer can do that, but that's what we do. So we, while we're meeting with the kids and we're becoming an expert on what this kid feels and thinks, and we're becoming their friend, we also are behind the scenes fighting it and pulling those threads. So when Bill says it's easy, it is easy to go in there and see the things that don't seem right. Like, why is no one addressing the fact that, here's an example, mom's boyfriend has a criminal record as long as his arm and is a sexual predator, and yet he's around this kid all the time. That seems simple to us, but no one else is asking that question. So we are the ones that say, hey, why are we talking about this? And just with that, just with starting that conversation, things change in these cases. The judge in Ripley County, I promise you, Judge Ryan King is the absolute most amazing judge I've ever worked with, and he has time after time after time told people that these CASAs are the ones that he looks to for information. They're the ones that don't have bias. They're the ones that go in there and say, hey, I don't, I don't know what all this means, but here it is. 
And he's able to make decisions based on these kids and the permanency in their lives because of having that person who's not biased look into that and come back and offer that information. It is a side that is not given in these cases without a CASA. So with that being said, nationally, CASA does a lot of studies to show the outcomes and the efficiency of, of what having a CASA volunteer does. And the website, if you all want to look at that, it's casaforchildren.org. And on that website, it has the results of these studies, and it shows that kids, these kids in the system like this who've been abused, if they have a CASA compared to the ones that don't, they do better in school. They have less chance of recidivism. They're in the system for a less amount of time. They receive more services, more individual services, and so do their parents than the kids who don't have CASAs. They score higher on nine protective factors, nine. They do better time after time after time, and it's just because they have an advocate and someone who's gonna step in and say, we're not gonna ignore this. This kid has a right, this kid has a right to be heard, and this is what's in his best interest, and that changes everything. And we have a team, we have 60 volunteers now. We have, I'm so thankful, we just got a big grant that will pay for staff for us. So we went from me being a one-man shop in 2015 to now, um, by the end of this month, we'll have nine staff. And that means we can have more volunteers because we were at our max of volunteers that we could have for the standards to manage these cases. So now, our goal in this next year for 2019 is to serve every one of these kids. And for years, we've said, we're gonna do this. And we had no idea how we were gonna do it. And now we know. Now we have the funds for the staff so we can manage this amount of cases. And we no longer are gonna have to look at these cases and we triage them. We score them on points on the type of abuse, the type of history, the, if they're in home placement, if they're out of home, I mean, all these things, we have to compare these abused kids and say which one deserves an advocate. And that, I promise you, is way harder than going and meeting these kids face to face and, and helping them through what they're going through. Every one of these kids deserves a chance. They deserve more than they've been given. And we get to be a part of that. And I promise you, it's just the coolest thing. It's really cool. And, I'm thankful for things like this. If you guys can, at minimum, just spread the word about CASA, about why we need more people, and about the changes that you can make in these kids' lives, because loving on them and caring about them and being the one they look forward to is, is, is the best, it's the best thing, I promise you. I have a CASA kid now who had never, he has attachment issues, he's 13, he's been in the system since he was five. And he could care less if I came or went. I mean, and if you, you'll learn with some of our kids we work with, when you go through trauma after trauma after trauma, that faith in anything is just gone. And people come and go, and, and he didn't care. And finally, this kid now calls me on the phone and asks me when I'm going to come see him. His parents' rights were terminated years ago. We, he's had several disrupted adoptions. And now when I'm there, he used to like not, not be able to wait till I was leaving and would just, you could tell he was going through the motions and he would stare at the ground. I would say things and he would just nod and, you know, half smile. And now he calls me, when are you coming? And I'll always bring a game for us to play. And, and then at the, uh, the other day I brought two games because I didn't know which one he would like. And at the end of playing for like an hour, he said, well, do you have to go? Can you stay and play this other game with me? It's just the most amazing thing to see this growth in these kids. And it's like when they see someone that believes in them and they've never seen that before, it's a gift. I promise you, it's a gift to be able to provide that for these kids. So that's it. I promise you, someday I'm going to be able to do this without crying. But um, we do have information on the table over there. Um, thankfully, we only have one application left because the Greensburg location took them all. Thank you. Um, but you can apply on our website as well, um, which is all on the information over there. It's an online app. Um, we, have, we follow this, the national standards for training. So it is a training class that we do on a Friday night and a Saturday day. We do it two weekends in a row. And um, we have one coming up at the end of October. All that information is over there. But this next year, we have to bring in double the volunteers that we've ever done so that we can serve every one of these kids. And we would love for you guys to look into that or spread the word. Maybe you know someone that would be a good CASA. Um, we would love to have you on our team. Thank you. You need to stay again. Sorry. Stay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing. I, I don't know if you've been able to tell she's somewhat passionate about this. <laughs> about this subject and um, we are so proud to be just a small part of what you guys do. We appreciate what you guys do day in and day out. Um, so now it's our turn. Um, we love supporting uh, Voices for Children. We love what they do. Uh, God did specifically say that he would 
step in and help with the children, that he cares for the children. Let the little children come to me, and CASA helps fill that gap. They help step in that gap. We talked about when we serve, when we serve in humbleness and obedience, he will grow our faith. And those 165 kids that are on the waiting list, they cannot be served without more volunteers. They just can't. For every one of their staff members they have, they can have a certain number of volunteers under them. So we give them money so they can hire staff, but they need volunteers. They need more people like Bill whose hearts are broken for what breaks God's heart. So there's a table over there, and I'm not going to let you off the hook because there's not applications. I really don't care if there's not applications. If you are interested, if God is tugging at your heart, if you felt tension and poked during this conversation, he's saying something to you, and you need to lean into that. I would love for you to go over, talk to Tanya, get scramble for the one application left. We will get you more. In your bulletin today on the connection card, there's a place for you to sign up to get more information on CASA. We will pass on your information so they can reach out to you. Or if you're still too busy, you can put up, can we put that up real quick, Sam? You can text CASA to 97000. You have no excuse not to answer the call God is giving you today if he's asking you to be a CASA. They're a tremendous organization. We would love to make more of a difference. I'd love to see dozens of CASAs out of our two campuses. So would you pray with me to close today? Dear Lord, we... We just thank you for an awesome time together this morning, uh, time to, to praise you, time to, to look at your instruction, how you are calling us to live so differently in this Me First world. And I thank you for, for Casa, I thank you for Tanya, for her staff, for the volunteers that currently step in that gap. It's heartbreaking to see kids, to know that there's children out there being abused, but it is great to see people stepping up and doing what they can, stepping into that gap, being their voice and their advocate. And we just ask that for, for those of us today that you've maybe touched with, with, uh, with this heartbreaking need, that you would allow us to serve and to serve humbly and to serve in obedience, to step into that gap, to allow others to see your love and compassion through us. It's in your wonderful name we pray, amen.